Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight. TV and film productions are shut down across the country as writers demand better pay. We're asking for just a livable wage and, and for our jobs to be protected and for us to make residuals on uh, the, the, the content we're creating. And police in Davis, California, are investigating three stabbings in the past week alone. Two people are dead, and the person responsible is still out there. God, just protect us all, man. Next thing you know, I hear her screaming, oh, God, help. When it comes to AI, how should it be regulated? If for some reason, God forbid, all these AI systems were trying to kill us, they would definitely kill us. And for the first time in more than 15 years, Hollywood writers are at the picket line. Thousands of union writers across both coasts went on strike early today. Many of them are still out on the picket lines after contract negotiations ground to a halt last night. Here's some of what we heard from writers here in L.A. I'm making less this year than I made the second year on my show because um, they're really sticking to the minimums that aren't raising and they're really like, they're nickel and diming us. What we're asking for isn't unreasonable, but the way that the studios have treated our requests is extremely unreasonable. There's no way for the industry to exist if things continue the way they are. And starting immediately, a lot of big shows are going dark this week, pulling out reruns as productions shut down. Despite that, last night at the Met Gala, a lot of celebrities said they were behind their writers. I support the writers, and I think it'll affect all of us. It'll affect every part of the industry and, and um, people beyond the industry. Uh, I wouldn't have a show if it wasn't for my writers, and I support them all the way. they got to have a fair contract, and they got a lot of stuff to iron out. And I'm a member of WGA and support WGA, and, you know, them getting what we, us, us, getting what we need. So I hope that no one wants to strike, but I hope that we're able to rectify this. I just hope everyone is treated equally. I hope that they get what they deserve and I hope that people listen to them. You know, people strike for a reason. Now, WGA members are asking for pay increases and structural changes to make a, a livable wage, especially in a world that has already been transformed by streaming services and is just starting to see AI creep into nearly every part of content creation. Now, in a statement, the WGA said the big studios have basically created an unsustainable gig economy inside a, of a union workforce. The alliance that represents major film studios and television networks issued a statement saying that they remain united in their desire to reach a deal. We do want to note that Comcast, the corporation that owns NBC Universal, is one of the entertainment companies represented by the Alliance. Some editorial employees of NBC Universal's news division are represented by the Writers Guild of America. And NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra joins us now. Marissa, you've been out there all day. What is the sense from those that are protesting? How long could this go on? Well, that's a great question. Um, and the number one thing that we're getting the sense of is they said they will fight as long as they have to. So for them, uh, I think the question, too, is when we talk about how long will this go on, um, a lot of times when you're looking at negotiations, I think it depends on how much they believe that the cause is worth it. And for them, they're really saying that their quality of life right now is just so low as a result of the way things have changed in this industry, particularly with streaming, but then looking forward ahead to the future as well. Um, they're saying that it's so low right now that the risk of not getting paid from gigs isn't really much different than how their life is currently. Uh, so, so not getting paid and not working is basically the same as working and, and getting paid small amount. That's what a lot of them are saying. Yeah. Are they working more than one job? That's the, and that's another thing. That's an interesting point you bring up, because um, for a lot of these folks, in fact, a large number of them, that has been one of the things that they're trying to negotiate. Um, when you have streaming shows, they're working on a streaming show. They're not able to work another job during that production time. So when you have a streaming show, this is a common problem we're seeing. You have fewer episodes than typically the, the historical broadcast shows, fewer episodes, but longer production time. They're getting paid less because they get paid less. They get paid by the episode. So, yeah, they're not able to go and work other jobs. And that's one of the things they brought to the negotiating table is let us go and work other jobs while we're stuck in production time on another.
What are the main sticking points here? What are the, like, the biggest divides at the bargaining table? Yeah, so aside from that last one I brought up, um, the, the main thing here is they're asking for an increase in pay. Um, and, of course, you know, the, the alliance representing the studio says that they offered a comprehensive package, quote-unquote. They said um, it had a generous increase in contribution to, to pension and health care plans. That's from their side. Um, but when you look at what both of them have said that were the points they could not move forward on, um, standard day rates. Uh, I know that the alliance for the studios was proposing something that the writers didn't like, and the writers were proposing something the studios didn't like, but where things really stalled was artificial intelligence. Um, and, and we know that writers were asking for some sort of reassurance, some sort of regulation that would promise, um, we're not just talking about today's writers, but tomorrow's writers, future writers, that we're not going to have robots doing their jobs. And we know studios really were not interested in making any promises about that, which we spoke to writers on the picket lines today. They said that was very concerning. Yeah, something along the lines of, like, we'll revisit every year and we'll come back and talk yeah, about it. Right? absolutely. It's so wild to think that in 2007, we didn't have streaming and we definitely didn't have AI. Yeah, and, and when we talk about 2007, um, that's an interesting point because... Streaming was just on the horizon. It was just barely a thought, and it was something that they brought up um, in those past negotiations. And I know that a lot of writers, and particularly one writer who's on the negotiating committee, said they wish that they had done more about streaming back then. So she said, we're taking the lessons we learned from the last writer's strike 15 years ago, and we're really drawing a line in the sand, and we're not going to back down when it comes to artificial intelligence because we saw what happened with streaming. We wish we had done more 15 years ago, so we see see the writing on the wall with where in intelligence is headed, particularly artificial intelligence. So we're going to learn from that and we're willing to take as long as it takes to do what we have to do to win this fight. So I would say that that's, um, if anything, Gotti, I think we should all buckle up because it's gonna be we, a long one. we don't know how long this is going to last. But I think given the conversations, given the tone and what I'm hearing from those in the negotiating committees, they're prepared for this to last a long time. Mr. Parra, thanks so much. Gotti, thank you. A series of mysterious stabbing attacks and killings have a small California college town on edge right now. At least two people have died and another seriously hurt in three attacks in Davis. All have happened in the last five days, and whoever did this is still out there. Police are looking into whether these attacks are related and have asked the FBI for help. NBC News correspondent Nyala Charles has more. Tonight, students on high alert with authorities working around the clock in Davis, California. After three stabbings in less than a week, leave two dead and one in critical condition. Families in mourning. He was on his way back home. He was literally five minutes away. And students on edge. You don't really feel safe anymore. And that's, that's really, really disheartening, especially in a city like this, where I was able to walk home every evening and feel safe. A manhunt for a suspect still underway. The FBI is helping the local police department. We're a small agency. Detectives sleeping under their desks for a couple hours, staying away from their families. Police say two of the incidents have similar suspect descriptions, but they don't have hard evidence linking the crimes together. All three assaults happening within two miles. These were uh, not stabbings where a, a person would normally be a victim of like a robbery or something like that, where there's just a couple of wounds. There were many and very significant uh, knife wounds. Davis is a quiet college town. and the county it's in usually sees fewer than 10 murders a year, according to state figures. At UC Davis, students are scared as they mourn one of their own. I don't want any of my friends to be like walking home like late at night. 20-year-old UC Davis student Kareem Abu Najim was killed Saturday, just weeks from graduation. His father heartbroken, honoring his son's accomplishments. He even far exceeded us. We're so proud. I do well with him. Just two days earlier, 50-year-old David Bro was killed in a nearby park. He was known as the compassion guy. David was one of the most kindest, compassionate people you'll ever know. He literally set out in this world to do good. In the latest stabbing, a 64-year-old woman is fighting for her life after getting stabbed inside a tent at a homeless encampment. Witnesses say they saw the suspect. I said, hey, bruh, he starts walking normal. And then I said, you look like a dude that they've been describing. I've been stabbing people. And he takes off. I started to take off after him. And then my wife's like, don't leave me here. The brazen nature of the crimes shocking even police. The suspect didn't seem to um, care that there were several witnesses who could identify him.
And Niall Charles joins us now. I know a little bit of a suspect description, but still no leads in this case? Yeah, so police are saying that they have a general description between the three three crimes that are similar. So they're saying that suspect is about 5'7", a lighter complexion. So that's what they're going off of now. But as you can imagine, that's pretty general. So they're still trying to target a specific suspect. What we do know, Gotti, is that they have canines on the ground to try to get hard evidence that they can use to maybe point to a certain suspect. And they've also gotten help from outside agencies because their police department is so small. The FBI is stepping in, so we expect that to be a big help in this investigation. What a terrifying, terrifying case. Ayala, thanks so much. The search for that Texas gunman who shot and killed five of his neighbors is still happening right now. It is the fourth day of this manhunt with no real leads. And some family members are outraged over why it took so long for police to show up in the first place. The suspect, 38-year-old Francisco Oropesa, is considered armed and dangerous. The FBI and local law enforcement are offering an $80,000 reward for information that leads to his arrest. Meanwhile, police are facing questions after family and friends of the victims are saying they had to call 911 again and again before help finally got there. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now from Cleveland, Texas. Uh, Priscilla, calling 911 repeatedly after something so horrific is, that's one thing. Uh, but did the family call 911 before the shooting even started? Yes, Gotti, they did. So we know that uh, after speaking with Wilson Garcia, one of the survivors, also the father of that nine-year-old boy who was killed, we know that after he went over to the suspect's home and asked him to stop shooting the gun in the front yard, he called police and said that the suspect was being threatening towards him. And he went on to say that he called police a total of five times. And we don't know how many of those calls were to talk about the threatening and how many of those calls actually occurred after the shooting began. But we're also hearing from another survivor, the brother of Sonia Guzman, another one of those victims. And he says that he called police as he was hiding in a closet and told them that the shooting was happening, was in progress. And all of these people say that it took anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes for police to arrive. They did not get there until the suspect had already fled. And we heard Mr. Guzman saying, wondering and questioning if more people would have survived or would have been alive had police gotten there sooner. Gotti? How is law enforcement responding to all this? Yeah, so we reached out to them specifically asking about the response time, and we haven't heard back from either the FBI or the San Jacinto Sheriff on that specific question. But on Saturday, when I spoke with the sheriff, he told me that the initial the initial call was for harassment and that seconds later they began to get calls that a shooting had occurred and that there were people who were potentially injured or deceased. And that is when they upped the priority of the calls. But just to give you a bit of context, we are in a very rural area here. The sheriff told the Associated Press that he has about three deputies that cover this 700 square mile area. And I will tell you, having been at the crime scene earlier this week, it is about 30 minutes from there to the sheriff's office. So still a lot of questions about this response time. And we'll probably learn more once those 911 calls are released. We have requested them and expect to receive them in the coming days. Gotti. And on this manhunt, is there is there any progress at all? We have not gotten any updates today in terms of a press conference. In fact, investigators have not held a press briefing in more than 48 hours, but they have been tweeting and they have said that in addition to the more than a dozen agencies who are working on this here in Texas, they are working with law enforcement across the country and also across the border to try to apprehend the suspect. The suspect they say they are looking at uh, hundreds of pieces of information and, of course, continuing to urge anyone who might have information to share to come forward immediately. Gotti. Oh, Priscilla, thanks so much. And President Biden is sending over a thousand soldiers to the southern border for at least three months. The administration is trying to uh, brace for a surge in migrants after that Title 42 COVID era immigration policy ends next week. Now, the troops are in addition to the 2,500 other military personnel already there, and we're told they are going to assist Border Patrol and not detain migrants. Meanwhile, three cities on the border have already declared a state of emergency as more and more people seek asylum and some facing horrific dangers while crossing through Mexico.
Si pasamos por una violación, ¿no? Por San Pedro, en México. Ah, entonces eso lo único que quiero es pasar con mis hijas. Scotty, those additional troops are expected to arrive beginning May 10th as the Biden administration prepares for an influx in migration that's been held back during the public health emergency. The Pentagon says these troops will come from the Army and Marine Corps, but will not be armed, use force, or make arrests. They'll serve administrative functions like monitoring, warehouse support, and data entry, so DHS law enforcement is freed up to do its job. The request for more personnel came directly from the Department of Homeland Security. DHS Secretary Alejandra Mayorkas talked just this week on Meet the Press about how strained the agency's resources are even before this surge. We are working within significant constraints. We need people. We need technology. We need facilities. We need transportation resources. All of the elements of addressing the needs of a large population of people arriving irregularly at our southern border. NBC News reports that DHS officials are anxious about a bottleneck and long processing times at the border when Title 42 is lifted. Last month, the acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection said the change could lead to 10,000 border crossings a day. That's double the current level. Now, the current infrastructure at the U.S. border would be maxed out if crossings exceeded 10,000 per day, leaving Border Patrol without the capacity to process them. Gotti? Kayla Tausche, thank you so much. Still ahead this hour, it looks like a week-long ceasefire is in the works in Sudan, but fighting has continued through previous ceasefires, so will this change anything? And Israel's government is making it easier for citizens to buy guns, but some are afraid it could lead to an epidemic of gun violence like we have here in the United States. You won't see any killing sprees like you see in America. Well, let's head around the world in 80 seconds. American journalist Evan Gershkovich is still locked up in Russia on spying charges, where it's being reported right now that he is in a cell with another inmate. Now, in an effort to boost his spirits, his colleagues have launched a letter-writing campaign, and anyone can send a message to Evan via the Wall Street Journal's website. Through a lawyer, Gershkovich said he is, quote, humbled and deeply touched by all those letters. And it looks like the generals on both sides of the fighting in Sudan have agreed to a week-long ceasefire. At least that's according to the foreign minister of South Sudan. Though right now, neither side has publicly confirmed anything. The World Health Organization says more than 500 people have died and over 4,000 have been hurt since fighting broke out last month. And U.S. ambassador to China, the U.S. ambassador to China says he is ready to hold high-level talks with the Chinese government and that he wants to establish stronger communication channels between the two superpowers. He did not, however, specify when those talks would begin or when Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to China would be rescheduled. It was canceled in February after a Chinese spy balloon was found flying over the United States. And gun ownership in Israel is on the rise, and it has a lot to do with loosening restrictions for thousands of its citizens. In fact, the number of gun licenses issued by the Israeli government has skyrocketed over the last few months. So why is it happening now? NBC's Josh Letterman takes a look. Gotti, when a Palestinian driver rammed his car into five civilians at this Jerusalem intersection earlier this month, Israel's national security minister praised the civilian who shot dead the suspected terrorist, saying he saved lives. Israel's government is pointing to this incident and others like it to explain why they want to see far more civilians carrying guns on Israel's streets. In an average month, the Israeli government issues about 2,000 gun licenses. But over the last three months, the number doubled as Israelis take advantage of looser rules for handguns. Israel's government says it's just getting started. It looks like something out of an action movie, but this training center deep in the West Bank is training civilians to use guns. They say they are needed to prevent terrorist attacks. Colonel Sharon Gott owns this firing range. Give responsible people to carry the weapon so they can stop attacks. Do you worry that with more guns on the streets, Israel could start to see gun violence like in the U.S.? No. Any terror attack where you see someone murdering civilians, you can use your weapon. Unlike the U.S., Israel has universal background checks. Getting a license requires a doctor's sign-off, gun training, an interview, and a reason you need extra security. 
With few exceptions, you can only have one gun and up to 50 bullets, and only pistols. But after a string of deadly attacks by Palestinians, Israel's far-right national security minister, Itamar Ben-Gvir, is promising change, aiming to issue five times as many licenses per month. Most moms don't want their kids anywhere near guns. Why did you bring your daughter here? Uh, we live in a reality where it is almost a necessity. There are stabbings and terrorist attacks everywhere, um, and we want to have a little bit of control. The current plan calls for shortening waiting times, doubling the staff who issue licenses, and eliminating interviews for firefighters, police, and military reservists. Although Israel has far fewer guns per person than the U.S., they're no less visible in a country always on high alert. Many Israelis were trained during military service. But while terrorism is a top concern, Israel doesn't see constant mass shootings like the U.S. School shootings are nearly non-existent. Are there lessons to be learned in Israel from gun violence in the U.S.? Definitely, definitely. It's, it's a path that we should look at very carefully. Pro-gun people tend to say very easily, we're not the U.S. <laughs> the question is, why aren't we the U.S.? Gun control advocates say more firearms will lead to vigilante justice with little accountability. This is where you were shot, right here? Oh, oh. Hader Gudab is 15, a Palestinian in Jerusalem's old city. Last month, he was walking home when he says an Orthodox Jewish neighbor blocked their shared alleyway. They began arguing, and the man started shooting. One bullet grazed Hader's neck, another struck his arm. Israeli police say the shooter was charged with unlawful use of a firearm and causing serious injury, briefly placed under house arrest, then conditionally released. The Israeli government wants more of these kinds of people to have handguns. Does that scare you? He says, not just me, everyone will be scared. After what happened to me, people here are scared to walk alone. But just like in the U.S., Israel's gun advocates say the guns themselves aren't the problem. Ben Goldstein believes they're the solution. He says a few years ago, he stopped a suspicious-looking Palestinian who he says was about to attack a supermarket. And after questioning him with no weapon in my hand, just like I'm standing now with my gun covered, he decided to try to slaughter me. And I'm standing talking to you today, and he's not. Even if Israel significantly loosens its gun laws, there are some things that won't change. Nobody here is talking about creating a constitutional right to bear arms, and Israel still intends to maintain a strict background check system. Israelis say there are some parts of America's gun culture they simply don't want to bring here. Gotti? Josh Letterman, thanks so much. Now, the coronation of King Charles III is just days away, and preparations are underway throughout London and at Westminster Abbey ahead of the weekend's pageantry. But before then, there is another big celebration in the royal family, one that could even eclipse King Charles' big day. That would be the birthday of his granddaughter. NBC's Molly Hunter reports. The countdown is on for the coronation, but there's one more royal celebration before the big day. Princess Charlotte turning eight years old today, smiling, albeit with a few missing teeth in a picture snapped by mom Kate. Over the weekend, the pair spotted out enjoying a mother-daughter birthday at the ballet, seeing Cinderella. And while Charlotte won't have an official role at the coronation, well, she's always found a way to grab our attention, just like little brother Louis. But older brother, nine-year-old Prince George, now the second in line to the throne, will serve as one of his grandfather's pages of honor. Traditionally, the children or grandchildren of the monarch haven't had a role in the coronation. Uh, Charles was simply an onlooker at his mother's coronation. A new BBC documentary sharing unseen photos of King Charles as a grandfather with George and Charlotte. He is going to be very keen to include those younger generations and to make it look more like a family affair. The whole young Wales family is expected to join the king on the Buckingham Palace balcony for that royal wave. Conspicuously absent, likely Prince Harry, who will reportedly be racing back home to California to celebrate his son Archie's fourth birthday. But it is largely a family affair. In the procession from Westminster Abbey back to the palace, the king's younger sister, Princess Anne, will ride on horseback behind the newly crowned king and queen. So I said, yes, not least of all, it I solves my dress problem. In a rare interview, Princess Anne maintains that Charles will keep the monarchy afloat despite a growing conversation about relevance. The monarchy provides with the constitution a degree of long-term 
uh, stability. Meanwhile, like so much in this coronation, the historic glittering robes that Charles will wear haven't been used in 70 years. Dusting those off, all part of these final days of preparation. Molly Hunter, NBC News. God save little Charlotte. Coming up, remember when thousands of flights were canceled last year? Well, it's looking like summer air travel is going to be booming, and there might be even more cancellations on the horizon. But first, we want to show you this. Most of the time when you throw things into the dumpster, you don't expect anything to come out. Well, this elementary school principal in West Virginia got a, a very unexpected surprise when he opened up a dumpster to find that black bear inside. The bear climbed out of the dumpster, ran away in the opposite direction. That viral video was uploaded to Facebook with the caption, who says principals don't deserve hazard pay? We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. You won't be hearing live from New York. It's Saturday night this weekend. Film and TV productions are shut down across the country because the Writers Guild is striking for better pay. The Biden administration is sending 1,500 troops to the southern border. The U.S. is preparing for an influx of migrants looking to cross the border when Title 42 is lifted later this month. And police in Davis, California, are investigating three stabbings that all happened within one week. Two of them were deadly, and officials think they may be connected. And a search for a convicted rapist and two missing teenage girls ended with a discovery of a much, much bigger crime scene. Investigators on the case say they found seven bodies on a property in Henrietta, Oklahoma. That's about 50 miles south of Tulsa. Police say the two missing teens and a possible convicted sex offender were among the dead. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more on the growing mystery. Gotti, look, the circumstances around these deaths are difficult here. Notably, we do not know exactly how these individuals died here at this point, but we do know that there are seven uh, bodies that were discovered by authorities at this Oklahoma property. And there's the one man, 39-year-old Jesse McFadden, who was a convicted felon, found guilty on first-degree rape charge back in 2003, served 17 years in prison, released in October of 2020. And on Monday morning, uh, the, the local police put out a missing persons alert that the two, two teenagers, 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, uh, were missing. And they said that they were believed to potentially be with McFadden. This was uh, uh, last seen at 122. 2 a.m. And by later on in the day, authorities had executed a search warrant of an Oklahoma property, and they had found what we believe to be the, these two teenagers, the 14 and 16 year old, but also four other bodies. And we now know uh, that an Oklahoma grandmother spoke with the AP this afternoon and explained that uh, those four other individuals were her 35 year old daughter and three of her grandchildren who had been living with McFadden. Uh, there are a a lot of questions because the grandmother says that he had a very uh, controlling demeanor toward them, that it was a lock and key type situation. He had to know where they were at all times. We now know here uh, that authorities over the last 24 hours have been examining these bodies. The medical examiner's office uh, is looking to uh, 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 absolutely identify that these seven individuals are who they believe to be, but authorities have said that there is no longer an active missing person situation, meaning they believe that uh, uh, those two teenage uh, girls that disappeared on Monday are, in fact, uh, among those seven deceased here. These are tough uh, details that authorities in the small Oklahoma community are now having to wade through. Gotti. Von Hilliard, thank you. Getting into a world-class university like UC Berkeley is hard enough as it is, but for students who were once incarcerated, overcoming the stigma of their criminal past and finding a place to live, it's even harder. Thankfully, one nonprofit is looking to change that, and NBC's Dana Griffith has their story. Ranked among the top research universities in the world, UC Berkeley is home to some of the brightest students in our nation, including these friends who have one thing in common. How many of you here have been formerly incarcerated? Show of hands. Due to their criminal backgrounds, securing housing in one of the most expensive markets in the nation has been difficult. It's hard going back home. Just, excuse me. Michelle Maxwell spent her first semester couch surfing and living out of her car. 
you know, if there's not really anywhere to go park, so you just kind of park wherever. You think that you're not going to get noticed. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. David Carranza and Jonathan Dina, who also served time, did notice. When they transferred to UC Berkeley, they discovered that the bulk of university-owned housing is reserved for freshmen and sophomores, leaving few spaces for older transfer students. So they created the nonprofit Create Innovations. It provides support and financial training for students in similar situations. They're now on a mission to buy their own building to house formerly incarcerated students. But they're facing resistance from hesitant investors. When you talk to an investor and you tell them, I want to put formerly incarcerated people inside a building, what are the words that come out of their mouths? They see risk, they see potential danger, or what is the return on my investment? The ultimate goal is like to have students not just survive, but to thrive. You would like for them to be able to come to a place where they could be at peace. That peace could make the difference for students who say the housing shortage fueled by landlords who don't want to lease to people with a background mentally affects their education. I've been able to try and keep up this facade really that I'm okay when really you're not okay. It's systemic. Margareta Lynn is a lecturer at UC Berkeley and executive director of Just Cities, an organization that advances racial justice in public policy and urban planning. Because of their criminal record, they actually confront a different layer of discrimination. In 2022, the organization conducted a survey of 118 students and found 83 percent of formerly incarcerated Berkeley students have faced housing insecurity while in school. In Alameda County itself, the average rent cost today is over $2,000. People just cannot afford to pay the damn rent. Dana Griffith, thanks so much. Now, we've got some breaking news right now that that mass shooting in Texas uh, has come to an end, the, the search for the gunman. Police appear to have arrested the suspected shooter who killed five of his neighbors on Friday. That person is believed to be Francisco Oropesa, and we are told he may be in custody. He's accused of shooting his neighbors after they complained about him firing his gun late into the night, keeping an infant awake. We're going to bring you more details as soon as they're available. And the man accused of stabbing Cash App founder Bob Lee did not enter a plea in court today. This is the third time his arraignment has been delayed. Lee's murder on April 4th sent shockwaves throughout the community, sparking fear that San Francisco is becoming more dangerous. Now, some businesses are leaving the city center, and today the department store chain Nordstrom announced it is closing two stores in downtown San Francisco. The spokesperson said the dynamics of the area have changed dramatically in recent years. Whole Foods is packing up, too. The grocery chain pointed to safety concerns for its decision to close a store in the same area. And it turns out the, violent, the city's violent reputation doesn't necessarily line up with a lot of the crime data. NBC's Jake Ward has the story. After Bob Lee's death in San Francisco, many commentators speculated on social media that the killer was someone homeless and mentally ill. David Sachs, a Silicon Valley investor, said so on his podcast. This idea of just releasing these people onto the street, I just think is an outrageous abdication of responsibility. But the man arrested in the crime turned out to be a tech consultant who knew the victim, according to police. And just like the mistaken assumptions in that case, San Francisco's dangerous reputation does not square with the data. San Francisco has challenges with crime, with public safety, and we're doing everything we can to deal with it. But just because people are seeing it in a more heightened way because of social media videos and sadly, sometimes people jumping to conclusions, it's unfortunately made San Francisco a bit of a target. Violent crime in San Francisco is at historic lows, and its murder rate is far below most other cities its size, according to police and FBI data. But the pandemic brought a wave of property crime. The bike connection saw its windows smashed repeatedly. Have you had much in the way of property damage since then? Thankfully, no. Just kind of vandalism type things, but we haven't had any major attempts to have our bikes stolen. No big break-ins. No big break-ins. What about drug activity on the streets? What do you see about that? That does seem to be worse. It seems like fentanyl has really gotten to a lot more kids. 
And that is where San Francisco really suffers. A fentanyl epidemic here, more than 200 overdose deaths in just the first three months of the year, has the governor calling in the Highway Patrol and the National Guard to help. The district attorney, Brooke Jenkins, criticized her predecessor's progressive reforms and ran for office on a platform of greater accountability. Prosecutions and convictions are up. I've taken a very strong approach in sending a message that this is not going to be something that we tolerate or take lightly because of the fact that we have so many overdose deaths. And should we be in any way uh, doubtful that that's going to make a difference, considering that we're not seeing fundamental numbers like overdose deaths go down? That those problems seem to be just as bad as they've ever been. It's a twofold situation. We have to have public health resources available to those who are struggling with addiction, while at the same time, law enforcement does its job to make sure that those who are peddling fentanyl are taken off the street or at the very least are held accountable. But while San Franciscans are as safe from violent crime as they were in the 1960s, Jenkins says perception as well as data shapes her priorities, like aggressively prosecuting drug dealers. Our metric is what the people of San Francisco feel, what the people who come into San Francisco to work and to visit feel. And irrespective of what the data shows, we have a job to do to make sure that we address that feeling. But the city's public defender says that perception distracts from long-term policies that can actually change the city's drug problem. Housing, job opportunities, people get more stable and people get more stable. We're less likely to have these kind of overdose deaths. And more prosecution does not, in your view, solve that problem? Not at all. We know that from 50 years of experience. Jake Ward reporting. Coming up, Congressman Ted Lieu sits down to talk to us about the dangers of AI and nuclear weapons. And as one of the few lawmakers with a degree in computer science, trust us, you don't want to miss what he has to say. And here's some of the headlines we're watching tonight. The Memphis police officer who pulled over Tyree Nichols will not face any charges. Preston Hempfield stopped Nichols over for reckless driving. He was fired from the force for multiple violations, including using his taser. But the DA's office says he won't be hit with charges because he wasn't at the scene where Nichols was brutally beaten. April showers bring May flowers? Well, not in Michigan. People in the state's Upper Peninsula have seen two feet of snow since Sunday. Not only did it cause terrible driving conditions, but it also led to a number of power outages. And yesterday, the area recorded a whopping 19.8 inches of snow, a single day record. And Vice Media could be on the verge of bankruptcy. And according to the New York Times, a filing could happen in the coming weeks. Vice will likely become the latest media company to take a hit in recent months. BuzzFeed just announced that it's closing its news division. And history has been made in this year's Tony nominations. Jay Harrison Gee and Alex Newell are the first gender nonconforming actors to be nominated for a Tony. Their choice to be nominated in the actor categories as opposed to actress categories was intentional, saying, quote, everyone who does acting is an actor that is genderless. And Canadian singer-songwriter Gordon, Gordon Lightfoot is dead at age 84. If you're not familiar with him, ask your parents. Lightfoot's 1970s hits like Sundown and If You Could Read My Mind were the soundtrack of a generation. His publicist says he died of natural causes in Toronto. And when it comes to the future of AI and all of its potential, for a lot of people, it is hard to get past any sort of doomsday apocalypse headline, which brings all those nagging feelings that we might be opening up Pandora's box that could lead to the end of the world as we know it. And yeah, science fiction might be to blame here, but for those of us that are on the outside of AI's development, it's pretty easy to get confused about what is hype and what is existential threat. However, what about those that were closest to it? Well, it turns out some of them are sounding alarms as well. The most likely way we die involves like not AI comes out of the blue and kills everyone, but involves we have deployed a lot of AI everywhere. And you can kind of just look and be like, oh yeah, if for, if for some reason, God forbid, all these AI systems were trying to kill us, they would definitely kill us. Paul Cristiano is one of the creators of ChatGPT, but no longer works for the company behind it, OpenAI, and he is not alone in raising serious concerns about its potential. In fact, the man known as the godfather of AI just quit Google. Jeffrey Hinton has studied AI systems for decades, and he told the New York Times it won't be easy preventing bad actors from doing bad things. What do we do to mitigate the long-term risks of um, things more intelligent than us taking control? 
So the question now seems to be, what are we going to do about it? Well, just recently, Senator Michael Bennett, a Democrat from Colorado, appeared to take the first steps towards regulating AI at the federal level, introducing a bill that would create a task force to identify risks. In the House, another bill would aim to block AI from launching nuclear weapons, something its sponsors say only humans should have the power to decide. But at the speed at which this thing is developing, is it too little too late? It feels more plausible now than it did five years ago by a lot that AI systems could do something really crazy and transformative. And I think it will feel much more plausible again in five years. And today with us on set is Democratic Congressman Ted Lieu, who represents California's 36th district. Congressman, welcome so much. I want to talk to you about you are one of the very rare exceptions when it comes to legislators uh, who are looking at this because you know exactly what you're talking about. You have a, a computer science background. And yet when you see some of the warnings and you see some of those that are working closest to AI uh, starting to speak out, what goes through your mind? Well, thank you, Gotti, for your question. I'm honored to be on the show. I'm a recovering computer science major, and I'm enthralled with AI, and it's done amazing things. It's going to help us and improve society. It can also kill us. It, simply put, it can also kill us. And uh, let's get into your, your bill, because this is at the heart of this bill, and, and I'm sure many more to come. Uh, we all have, like, a nervous chuckle when we say things like that, and yet it's it's an existential threat in some ways, right? So let me tell you how I look at it as a legislator. So there are two circles. There's AI we don't care about and AI we might want to regulate. So the AI we don't care about. So let's say the AI in your smart toaster has a preference for, you know, English muffins over toast and makes English muffins better. We don't care about that. But the AI we might want to regulate are AI that can cause us harm or can kill us. So, for example, when your cell phone malfunctions, it's not going 60 miles per hour. But if AI automated vehicle malfunctions, like a Tesla did last November, it's just stopped in the middle of a tunnel, caused a multi-vehicle accident, multiple victims. And if you gave AI control nuclear weapons, that can also kill us. And that's why I've introduced bipartisan legislation to prevent that from happening. Now, it seems like a no-brainer. Don't give AI the codes to our nuclear arsenal. And yet, when we're looking at modernizing so much of our, our, our weapons and our defense across the country, is there any way to prevent AI from, uh, from getting into our, our defense? So the Department of Defense has this class of weapons called autonomous weapons that can launch automatically. And we introduced this legislation because we want to make sure that no matter how smart AI gets, it can never have operational control over nuclear weapons. We always have to have a human in the loop. And I'm pleased that Congressman Don Beyer, Republican Congressman uh, Ken Buck, and on the Senate side, Ed Markey are also leading on this effort. It's bicameral, it's bipartisan. I think we need to put it into law so that this can never change. Keep a human in the loop. What does that, what does that physically look like? What does that mean? We're going to require that any launch of a nuclear weapon be done by a human being. The specific phrase we use is meaningful human control. But there's also AI that even though it can't kill you, it can harm you. Mm -hmm. So for example, facial recognition technology, it's amazing. It can recognize faces better than most human beings can, but it's also worse for people with darker skin. And so if you have AI facial recognition technology deployed at law enforcement agencies across America, to me, it's one big equal protection violation because minorities will be misidentified at higher rates. And so I've introduced legislation to put guardrails on that and to require warrants and other standards. Uh, circling back just to the uh, to your, your nuclear bill. Uh, it's one thing for us to do it. Are there any assurances that other countries, China, Russia will follow? There are not. And so hopefully, if the U.S. does this, then other countries will do it as well. And one of the things we have to do is make sure that all the countries start talking about the risks of AI, because it's not just a U.S. problem. I, interestingly enough, like, I, I play with chat GPT pretty frequently, especially before a segment like this. Uh, actually, I'm just going to pass this to you. I asked it to write a haiku about why, uh -huh. why we need to regulate AI's integration into our nuclear arsenal. Yeah, if you can you see it there? Yes. What does it say? It says infinite power guided by a cautious hand, AI's reign restrained. 
That's a lot of wisdom there. <laughs> a lot of wisdom, uh, hopefully a, a lot of wisdom going into this legislation as well. Uh, switching gears to obviously nuclear arsenal, nuclear Armageddon, that is a threat. And yet uh, when we start to look at the optimization and the ability that AI has in terms of, of optimizing, um, one thing that comes to mind is this paperclip theory, right? Like the paperclip problem where, you know, if we train an AI, and this is like a, a, a you know, a thought problem, but if you train an AI to, optimize to make paper clips all of a sudden it takes over the world in a mission to create paper clips uh, fun to think about but do you think that maybe uh, an existential threat might come from something uh, that uh, seems a little bit more harmless like the like the toaster that prefers the english right. muffin uh I think that's unlikely because you have to give AI control over things, right? It can't just by itself assert control. So the AI in your toaster is never going to leave that toaster. Now, what's much more likely is AI can be used in bad ways by bad people. So, for example, ChatGPT is enormously effective at hacking. It's also really good at spreading massive disinformation. But the creators of ChatGPT put guardrails in to prevent you from doing that. But well, you can imagine other companies, other countries not putting those guardrails in. So I think a more likely danger is people using AI for bad reasons. We've also seen and not just other countries de developing this. A lot of this is going into open source development across the, the United States and elsewhere, right? Are you concerned that, you know, it's one thing to have guardrails go up at companies that can be held accountable, but developing all this open source where there's not really any accountability, how do you legislate that? That's a great question. So I'm also very aware of what I don't know and what we all don't know. We're really just seeing, right, the second release of ChatGPT, but what happens with ChatGPT version eight? I think at the end of the day, we're gonna need to do some sort of regulatory structure. And so I have um, proposed a bill, and I'm in the process of writing it, to create a bipartisan blue ribbon commission to make recommendations to Congress as how we would look at what kinds of AI to regulate and how we go about doing so. And when a regulator makes a mistake, they can correct it much easier without another act of Congress. Now, hopefully, Congressman, you solved the, the nuclear problem here. But last question, what keeps you up at night beyond this? Well, so there's going to be a lot of societal disruption. All human tasks could be um, replicated in some way by AI or certainly made easier. Many of us are going to be able to do what we do with AI and be just as productive in a four-day work week as we do in a five-day work week. So I vote for the four-day work week. Four-day work week. All right, Congressman, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. And back to that breaking news out of Texas. Police have apprehended a suspect in that mass shooting of five people Friday night. All of this happening after a manhunt that has lasted for days. NBC's Sam Brock joins us now uh, on the phone. Sam, can you bring us up to speed here? Uh, what do we know right now? Yeah, Gotti, certainly. So in about the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to hear from the FBI and the San Jacinto County Sheriff's Department, so local and federal authorities, about what's transpired. This appears to end, Gotti, a four-day, 250-person, all-out manhunt for someone who was accused of brutally murdering five people living next to him, including a nine-year-old boy and uh, people aged really nine to 31 years old, the Honduran family. Just the brutality of the crime from the details that we've received absolutely makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. In terms of how he was captured, we don't have those details yet, and this is all pending, Gotti, according to the local district attorney, the fingerprint. So they believe that this is, in fact, Francisco Orapesa, uh, but they do need to go through the processes right now to make sure it is actually him. There were a couple of false flags earlier this week that turned out to be nothing, but in this case, there seems to be a high degree of confidence the fact that the FBI is calling this press conference in the first place, that it is, in fact, him. And it comes, Gotti, on the heels not just of this manhunt, but of new reporting from NBC News this evening about his criminal history, and certainly a history that we thought was, was relatively light on violence. Well, it turns out that in 2022, according to the district attorney here, his wife had filed for a protective order because she had accused him of being drunk and beating her, kicking her and punching her with a closed fist. Now, that ended up being a civil matter that was never resolved. In fact, it's still an open case, but it does store, sort of paint the picture of what we were trying to understand about the background of this man. We also know he had been deported four times, according to ICE, twice in 2009, again in 2012, and again in 2016. And, of course, we are now trying to digest the news that he is behind bars. There was a concern, truly, that he was a threat to the community, armed and dangerous, according to law enforcement. They had seized three firearms from his house, but it was believed that he might have had a handgun as well. He was apprehended in a town called Cut and Shoot, Texas. 
That is actually what it's called. It is 15 or 20 minutes from where I am right now uh, by this briefing, and it is relatively close to his home. So despite the fact that there were concerns initially that he might have left the country, that this wasn't just a county-wide search, but a, a potentially a multi-country search, it appears he was kind of in the backyard of where he's living. What a pesa. Apprehended tonight, pending Gotti, those fingerprints. And who are we going to hear from at this press conference? Uh, certainly the special agent in charge of the FBI, James Smith, would imagine would be one of the folks that's going to be briefing us here. Uh, the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Capers for San Jacinto County, he had not said anything really in the last 48 hours, which there's a lot of questions for him as community members have voiced their concern after these reports that there were so many calls that were placed. According to one family member, five over 20 minutes. Another said uh, just as many over a half an hour uh, to try to get authorities out to their home and the perceived lack of a quick response there. So he will, will most likely will be addressing us. Uh, we have not received an actual list of who's speaking, but that would be my best guess. A community that has been filled with anxiety over the last few days without getting answers, and now all of a sudden an arrest. NBC's Sam Brock, thanks so much. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.